My name is Valdek Kozacuk. I have been contributing to the OSV project since 2016 and three years ago, I was nominated to be one of its committers. My greatest contributions to the project include making OSV run on Firecracker and significantly improving ARM port. I'm here to tell you about OSV and why I think it is an excellent platform to run both stateless and serverless apps in the cloud. OSV is a unikernel that was designed to run single unmodified Linux application on top of hypervisor, whereas traditional operating systems were originally designed to run on a vast range of physical machines. But simply speaking, OSV is an OS designed to run single application without isolation between application and kernel. Or it can be thought as a way to run highly isolated processes without ability to make system calls to host OS. Finally, OSV can run on both 64-bit x86 and ARM architectures. In this slide, you can see major components of OSV across the logical layers. Starting with Lipsy at the top, which is greatly based on Musil, then core layer in the middle, comprised of Elf Dynamic Linker, VFS, Networking Stack, Thread Scheduler, Page Cache, RCU, and memory management components. Then finally down, the layer composed of the clock, block, and networking device drivers that allow OSV interact with hypervisors like VMware and VirtualBox, or the ones based on KVM and Zen. I will not go into more detail, but I will leave you with this diagram as a reference if you want to learn more about OSV design later. Why do I think that stateless and serverless workloads are a good fit for OSV? It is because they can benefit from its ability to boot fast, low memory utilization, and optimize networking stack originating from FreeBSD, but heavily enhanced with Van Jacobsen NAN channels. Now, short time, low memory utilization, small kernel size, and optimized networking stack allows to run more OSV guests on given host and serve more client requests while using less resources like memory and CPU. In the following slides, I will describe each of these aspects in more detail. OSV can boot as fast as five milliseconds on Firecracker and three milliseconds on Camel Micro VM machine. And it's mainly because it starts the boot process in the 64-bit mode and probes and initializes very few devices mostly para virtual ones like Virtio and Z. Now, depending on the boot parameters, type of the file system and hypervisor settings, the boot time will vary. For more details, please check OSV wiki page. One way to lower memory utilization of the guest is to minimize the kernel size. Currently, OSV comes with a single universal kernel that supports quite many devices and hypervisors out of the box. It also provides quite large spectrum of the libc library and even full standard C++ library, as you can tell from the list in this slide, regardless if given app uses them or not. So the question may be posed, why not offer a mechanism to build custom kernel to exclude unneeded drivers and symbols? The extra benefit of fewer exported symbols is increased security that stems from the fact that there is simply less potentially harmful code left. In the next five slides, I will describe the experiments I have conducted to reduce kernel size from 6.7 to 2.6 megabytes, almost one third of the original one. Bulk of the OSV kernel is implemented in C++, but currently it also includes full copy of the standard C++ library. This makes it easy to run C++ applications, but on the other hand, it makes the kernel dramatically larger and is not needed for non-C++ apps. So in this experiment, I change the linker script and make file to hide all symbols from the standard C++ library. This helped reduce the kernel size from 6.7 to 5 megabytes, around 25% decrease. Even after hiding C++ library, there's still some code left that is not referenced by anything during runtime. 
This code garbage can be eliminated by the garbage collection mechanism in GCC. As you can see in this slide, by adding relevant compiler and linker flags to the make file, as well as necessary keep statements to the linker script, I was able to reduce the kernel size from five to 4.3 megabytes, another around two and 10 and half percent decrease. The ZFS is a full featured read write file system embedded in the OSV kernel. The stateless and serverless workloads do not really need read write file system. Instead, simple read only file system should be sufficient to load application code and configuration from in most cases. Sometimes it might be necessary to write information like logs to the disk. So ideally, it would be nice to have a simple read write file system that could be dynamically plugged in form of a library, if needed. In long term, we could make ZFS pluggable or find or write a simpler read write file system. Another alternative could be enhancing existing VirtuOFS driver to support writing. But in short term, adding a build option to remove ZFS from the kernel, if not needed, would allow us to reduce kernel size from 4.3 to 3.6 megabytes. Another 10 and half percent decrease. Please note that in previous three steps I have described up to this point, make the kernel almost half of its original size, yet still leave it a generic one. In this and next slide, I will describe experiments to create custom kernel tailored to specific hypervisor or application and reduce its size at the same time. In most cases, OSV would be deployed on given hypervisor with specific set of devices. Therefore, it would make sense to have a build mechanism to create a kernel with drivers only needed. We could have a mechanism equivalent of menu config in Linux to include only what is desired for given platform and use a use case, for example, virtio only on KVM. In this experiment, I added relevant if devs to the code and make file in order to build micro VM profile of the kernel that has enough drivers to run OSV on Firecracker and Camel micro VM machine. As a result, I was able to further reduce kernel size from 3.6 to 3.1 megabytes, another 7.5% decrease. Now, besides selecting only needed drivers, we could envision another mechanism to exclude all LIPSI symbols and relevant code from the kernel but the only ones needed by specific application. Luckily, most apps interact with the kernel via Lipsy API. So it should be possible to create an automated tool set that would inspect application elk and related objects and create custom linker version script with symbols only needed by the application. Obviously, this would not work for deal open cases and possibly be more difficult to achieve with apps using syscall instruction or statically linked executables that OSV is yet to support. In this experiment, I have managed to employ some preliminary scripts to generate a linker version script for single, for simple Hello World Java app that would produce a kernel as small as 2.6 megabytes, another 7.5% decrease. Another benefit of excluding unneeded symbols and drivers is increased security due to removal of potentially harmful or buggy code from the kernel that in theory could be invoked by some malicious dynamically inserted code in the application. Finally, as the result of trimming kernel size in these five experiments, I was able to run a native C Hello World app on OSV using only a total of 11 megabytes of memory, down from 15. In this and next three slides, I will present and discuss the results of an interesting experiment I have conducted specifically for this presentation. This objective, the objective was to find out how many OSV guests can be booted and shut down concurrently on the C5N Metal AWS Nitro instance, which comes with 72 CPUs and 192 gigabytes of RAM. The test setup involved running the loop scripts where each would start an OSV instance on Firecracker sequentially one after another. The disk with read-only FS contained a C Hello World app executed upon OSV boot. In the beginning of the test, I started 100 loops in parallel, and then roughly every minute, I would start extra 100 more loops, going all the way to 700 in the end. 
During the seven minutes, two seconds long run, I was able to boot and shut down 629,625 OSV guests. During this time, I could observe the average number of 1,492 boots per second, and the maximum number of boots per second reached almost 1,900. The OSV guest boot time was 9 milliseconds at 50th percentile, around 12 milliseconds at 75th percentile, 17 milliseconds at 90th percentile, and around 31 and a half milliseconds at 99th percentile across all samples during this seven minutes run. In the upper part of this slide, you can see a time series graph depicting the 50th, 90th, and 99th percentile of the OSV boot time across the samples within each single second of all 422 seconds and how these values have fluctuated across seven minutes of the test. In the bottom of this slide and the next two ones, you can see a corresponding time series illustrating the progress of concurrent loops during the same time. One can see that the 50th percentile of the boot time stayed pretty much stable at slightly below, below 20, 10 milliseconds. The 90th percentile started at 15 milliseconds and grew to 20 milliseconds at 300 concurrent loops. Finally, the 99th percentile fluctuated starting from 18 to 40, 45 milliseconds, depending on the number of concurrent loops. In the bottom of the second slide, you can see the exact same time series as in the slide before. In the upper part, however, you can see a time series depicting number of boots per second for each of the 422 seconds of the test. You may not be able to tell exactly from the graph, but the maximum of 1,899 boots per second was reached in the 156 seconds, two minutes, 33 seconds at 400 concurrent loops. Finally, in the third slide, you can see how the host CPUs Utilization fluctuated over the seven minutes of the test, starting at 55% and reaching over 80% at 300 concurrent loops and staying like that all the way to the end. In this and next five slides, I will be presenting the results of other experiments I have conducted specifically for this presentation as well. This time, my goal was to measure throughput and latency of various stateless workloads on OSV and compare them to Linux guests. All work workloads involve serving static content over HTTP for requests generated by the load generator work. Unlike the former one, these experiments were run in my home lab with two machines connected over one gigabit ethernet. One of them, eight-way Intel i7 2.3 gigahertz machine with Ubuntu 2010, served as a OSV Linux guest host. And second one, eight-way i7 2.7 gigahertz machine with Fedora 33, served as a test load generator where work would be running. Both OSV 056 and Fedora 33 guests would run on CAMU 5.0 with identical setup, vhost networking bridge to expose guest interface with local ethernet. Running Hyper 3 established networking speed at around 940 megabits between the machines. Finally, each of the tests was executed with one and two and four vCPUs where it made sense to see how both OSV and Linux guests scale and compare to the results of, their, of running the same test directly on Linux host as a baseline. In the first experiment, I measured performance and latency of NGNX. Because OSV supports single process by design and NGNX worker is a process, it only made sense to run this test with one vCPU and NGNX configured to run as a single worker. Just like in the next four experiments, I ran the five seconds long load test three times and selected the best result. In each instance, work would generate load using eight threads and 100 concurrent con connections. As you can see in this slide, OSV outperformed the Linux guest by almost 50% in terms of throughput and 88% shorter P99 latency. In the second experiment, I captured the same metrics when running Node.js. Like with NGINX, because single Node.js process is designed to run on single vCPU, 
it also only made sense to run the test with one vCPU. Also, like with the previous experiment, work would generate load in the exact same way. As you can see in this slide, OSV again outperformed the Linux guest by 46% in terms of throughput and half of the P99 latency. In the third experiment, I again recorded the same metrics, but this time when running an app with simple REST API implemented in Golang. Unlike in two previous experiments, this time I ran the test with one, two, and four vCPUs. The work would generate load in the exact same way as previously. As you can see in this slide, with one vCPU, OSV outperformed the Linux guest by almost 70% in terms of throughput and 38% shorter P99 latency. With two vCPUs, OSV again outperformed Linux guest by almost 50% in terms of throughput, but yielded 73% percent longer latency. Unfortunately, with four vCPUs, OSV underperformed in both metrics by 12% in throughput and 34% latency. In the fourth experiment, I again captured the same metrics, but this time when running an app with simple REST API implemented in Rust using Tokyo and Hyper libraries. As in previous experiment, I ran the test with one, two, and four vCPUs. The work would generate load in almost the same way as previously, except with 200 threads instead of 100. This time, as you can see in this slide, OSV outperformed Linux guest only in one vCPU case by more than 100% in terms of throughput and 25% shorter P99 latency. Unfortunately, with two vCPUs, OSV underperformed Linux guest by over 30% in terms of throughput and slightly longer latency. With four vCPUs, OSV underperformed even more in both metrics by 64% in throughput and over 300% in latency. So OSV did not scale at all with the number of CPUs. But after some digging, I discovered that OSV performed poorly because it does not implement the socket option SO reuse port, with those, which those Rust frameworks rely on to load balance requests across listener sockets on all CPUs. Hopefully, by the time you will be watching this presentation, I might have some interesting updates regarding SO reuse port support in OSV. In the last of these five experiments, I tested performance of an app on JVM implemented in Scala using Akai HTTP framework. As in previous experiment, I ran the test with one, two, and four vCPUs. The work would generate load using eight threads and 100 concurrent connections. As you can see in this slide, OSV outperformed the Linux guest in all three cases, with one vCPU by over 250% in terms of throughput and 90% shorter P99 latency, with two vCPUs by over 140% in terms of throughput and almost 70% shorter P99 latency. And finally, with four vCPUs by almost 60% in terms of throughput, but yielded 37% longer latency. It is also worth pointing out that with one and two vCPUs, OSV outperformed the Linux host in terms of requests per second. As you know, optimizing software stack is a never ending story. So besides ideas I have pointed out so far, like implementing a SO reuse port support, lazy application stack and making L1, L2 sizing logic more self-tunable, there are many other ones identified, identified in the GitHub issues. Some notable ones include optimizing atomic operations in non-SMP mode and reducing log contention in Futex implementation to improve performance of Golang apps. I hope you have enjoyed my presentation and learned a bit about why OSV is an excellent platform to run stateless and serverless apps in the cloud. If you have more questions, feel free to ask them on OSV emailing list. At the same time, I also encourage you to join our small team of volunteers to help us in effort to improve OSV even more. Thank you.